Ross, David Caravan, and Kevin Pereira. It's good to see you. Hello. I'm Jean. Yes, you are. All Jean. Yep. And I'm Candace Bailey. We are coming to you from the G4 Studios in Los Angeles. On the program today, a personal hero, Weird Al Yankovic, ladies and gentlemen. His new album, El Apocalypse, is on sale now. And find out if there will ever be a UHF 2. Please make it happen. Then we'll find out how you did captioning this week's Around the Net. Are you going to make us laugh? Or... Oh. You okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Plus, Blair Butler has exclusive Marvel news and a review of an adults-only G.I. Joe comic. Plus, she learned to fly with her magical after effects. Oh, nice. And then in an all-new weekend edition of DV Doomsday, Chris Gore reviews the classic sci-fi films Logan's Run and Silent Run. They don't have Run in them. They do. Yeah. It's a coincidence. It's, it's a amazing. theme. Theme Doomsday. <laughs> hey, why not go around the... Damn it! Oh. We have a, a horrible homeless problem here in the studio. You, Fax Bear, you cannot beg here. No. You can't no. beg here. No. But he's giving away Uncharted 3 multiplayer beta codes. Well, I don't. You know what? No, give me those, give me those codes. Yeah. Come now in. you have nothing. Oh. Now you have nothing, you stupid bear. Oh I hate you. So mean. Oh. It's okay, Fax Bear. Huh? It's okay to be homeless. He's gonna maul your lady parts. He consented. <laughs> Fine. Give him some money. No, we're going around the net. <laughs> well, I'm chock full of it. So. You are. In at number three today, a man versus a locked bathroom stall. Hooray. He got it. Hey, get my hat. Get my hat, G. Get my hat, G. Oh, oh, Dude. <sighs> <laughs> Is that how you think he reacted when he got up and wiped no, the feces off of his shirt? No, that's how I'm reacting to him. Oh, dude. dude. <laughs> uh, we asked you, what's the name of this nightclub? Slacky Hackages. Assuming they were in the bathroom of a nightclub, by the way. <laughs> it could have been a Shakey's Pizza. We don't know. But what's the name of the nightclub? Slacky Hackigen said the parkour pucatorium. Pretorium. <laughs> Shut up. He wrote something Pucatorium. close to that. Yeah. Uh, and Wayne Pop One said Studio 54 Loco. <laughs> And a number two today, cutting edge visual effects. What were you I doing? I was vomiting under? for Loco and then crying on my penis. That's about it. <laughs> Prepare to be amazed. We asked you, what's the name of this summer blockbuster? Joey Winston said, Transformers 4. <laughs> pretty good. In at number one today, <laughs> some amazing found footage. Uh, if you ever wanted to know what Cloverfield would look like if it starred a seagull, here you go.
Easy, yeah. Creeper. That's amazing. That's my first time seeing that. Yeah, it's pretty I sweet, right? Here Monday. Yeah. We asked you, what's the name of the Seagulls' new YouTube channel? Uh, Rhino Pat said, Lonely Goal 15. Oh. <laughs> that, was, that was good. I like that one. Vader Prime 1 said, Flyway Robbery. Oh. Nah, I wasn't good. <laughs> uh, and Nintendo Wee Boy said, Goals Gone Wild. Yeah. Yay! There you go. To get your daily viral fix and check out all the viral videos we have to offer, go to g4tv.com slash Today's gadget prawn is Samsung's Google Chromebook. Yay! It could usher in a new era of devices without touch screens. Or it could suck. And Chris Galore goes to Russia to meet the cast of Transformers 3 and probably gets shot by the KGB. We don't know for sure. No. I haven't checked. This portion of Attack of the Show is brought to you by eHarmony.com. Sign up and see who you'd be matched with. We sent Chris Gore to Russia in hopes of reigniting the Cold War. Yeah, thankfully, things were resolved peacefully once he sat down with the cast of Transformers 3. Chris Gore here in Moscow, where the world premiere of Transformers Dark of the Moon will take place in front of Russians and Americans joined in their love. Giant robots that beat the living out of each other. My burps taste like vodka. Here we go! Autobots and Decepticons are at it again in Transformers Dark of the Moon. In the final battle, Optimus Prime must learn the secrets of a spaceship from Cybertron that crash landed on the moon in order to defeat Megatron. You cannot believe what we're saying. Oh so I have to ask, how do you survive a Michael Bay film? Oh, oh my God. Uh, it takes resilience to get through the movies. They're, they're the hardest movies you could possibly ask to be a part of in Hollywood. They're very hard to make. What was it like working with Megatron? Really difficult. Probably the hardest uh, character of a person I've ever had to work with. The demands, the rider in his contract. Of course, he doesn't have a trailer. He smells. He does. Most people don't realize that the oil and the things like that, and he needs to use my cologne from Avon. But, you know, he did, I, I give it to him as a wrap gift. Your character wants to box an Autobot. What kind of crazy person would challenge an Autobot? He's a kind of blowhard and and doofus. You know, it's like someone who'd want to spar a little bit with Muhammad Ali. I wouldn't have thought it was a good idea, but, you know, okay if you want to. In the last battle, you're wearing heels the whole yeah. time? Mr. Gore, please, you exaggerate. Yeah, that wasn't a bright idea of mine. I remember saying, yeah, yeah, I'll wear heels the whole way through the movie. Sure, no problem. And then instantly realized once I'd shot my first action sequences that I was now going to have to be in them for the whole movie. But I think it was the one thing I was able to take from my modeling career onto film was, was knowing how to walk and run in them. So You've made a grave mistake. How is it that a hot woman and a hot car alike. How do I phrase this? <laughs> a, a great car you really want to drive. As this woman right here is my secret weapon. Tell me how you did that scene where you glide into Chicago, downtown Chicago. Well, there was guys who are much braver than I who jumped off the top of buildings and out of helicopters. I was down below the Trump Tower looking straight up, all of a sudden you see these tiny little black specks just flying out, and these guys just jump, and then pull their shoes. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, my heart sank every time they did it. They did it like four times in a row. And then they would land, and then I would push them out of the way and then step in for my close-up. If you had to guess, how many explosions are in the film? Oh, dude, I don't know, I, know, I could never, I could never guess. I don't know, it'd be a crazy drinking name, though. Somebody would die. <laughs> Turn the brain off and feast on all the eye-popping action that only a Michael Bay film can deliver in Transformers Dark of the Moon. Google would, would really like it. They'd appreciate it if you just didn't buy an iPad. But they are offering an alternative. Here's Gadgetpron. Now that Google has practically taken over the internet and your smartphone, why not let them run your computer too? Introducing the Samsung Chromebook. 
Powered by Chrome OS and a 16 gig solid state drive, this netbook boots in less than 10 seconds so you can read email, edit documents, or browse the web instantly through the cloud. Plus, it only weighs 3.3 pounds, so this true netbook will go anywhere, starting at 430 bucks. Here she is. Here I am. Yes. Thank you. So is it a netbook or is it a tablet without a touch screen? It's both and neither. Huh? There you go. Review done. Uh, it's, here's the thing, it's nice and slim, which is cool. The keyboard feels very Mac-like. There's handy shortcut keys along the top that'll give you quick access to volume controls, brightness, full screen, uh, you know, browser tab switching, if you will, like an alt-tab button. Uh -huh. uh, the entire touchpad feels pretty good, and you can do the two-finger scroll. I, I wish it had more gestures. I, I like that on my MacBook I can, you know, go forward and backward uh -huh. in a browser window with, with three fingers, and this is essentially just a browser, so it'd be nice. Uh, the whole surface is clickable, which is cool. Now, there's 16 gigs of onboard storage so you can save a few files locally like a netbook um, but that's really where the similarities end between this and a netbook yeah it's running Google's Chrome OS which means sure everything is. runs inside a web browser so did you feel that that set up a bunch of limitations not a bunch but definitely some yeah. uh, the Chrome web store lets you install apps and games which is great mm -hmm. in some cases though it just means that it adds a shortcut page uh, a shortcut to like a web page that's uh -huh. all it is it's like a glory it's an icon that takes you to a web browser and that's all uh, that's it in other <laughs> cases it actually installs data to the hard drive so apps like the New York Times can be used offline but the problem is that it's unclear when an installed app will actually work offline yeah so for example you'd have to install extensions and an offline uh, word processor uh, to actually edit a text document on this thing if you're on it's an airplane. such a huge hassle. It doesn't make any sense. Google Docs doesn't work offline, yet Angry Birds and New York Times does. Other games don't work offline, so it's really yeah, hit or miss. You don't know. Uh, you don't know until you shut off all the wireless access and actually click on it that you can't run it. Um, Hulu works great. There's no Netflix streaming yet, um, and that's about it for apps right now. Well, is it fast enough to do a bunch of things at once? Uh, no, no. Most of the performance issues... Things? Here's the thing. Uh, you, you, you can turn it on which is cool. No way! Um, most of the performance issues that we ran into were Flash-based sites, which is a lot of the internet. Uh -huh. uh, booting it up is incredibly fast. That was nice, and that's thanks to the solid-state drive and a minimal operating system. We were up and running in about 10 seconds every time. Um, as with most netbooks, 720p videos, they're watchable, but you're probably mm -hmm. gonna watch in 480p, and don't even think about ultra-high def. Don't think about 1080p. It's not happening. No? You can think about it. You're only gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> oh. um, as for games, Again, we hope you like Angry Birds and Othello. I do. <laughs> well, great. You're in luck, and you want to spend half a grand on this thing. No. Um, there's a broad selection, but they're mostly casual games like Pagel or Pagel Plus or Pagel Extreme or looks and plays just like Pagel but isn't called Pagel. That game's on there. <laughs> during testing, we hit some out-of-memory errors, which was a bummer, and we had running tabs crash during our testing. Flash was almost always the culprit, but... You know, the thing about like the Chrome browser on a normal uh -huh. PC is that if you have a tab crash, theoretically it doesn't, it doesn't wreck the tabs that are alongside of it. Yeah. So if you're working on your thesis in one video or on one, in one tab and then watching a chipmunk video in the other, just the one. if the chipmunk crashes, you don't lose all your hard work. On yeah. this thing, whenever we had a, a tab crash, it took out the entire system. It took out every single tab. Yeah. You can't have that sort of instability no, there. No, that's awful. Well, the Chromebook comes in two flavors. Sure does. $430 for Wi-Fi only and Wi-Fi plus 3G mm. for 500 bucks. Boy, both those flavors sound delicious. <laughs> Is it 3G worth it? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. If you're going to actually get one of these things, you have to get the 3G version because you're you so <laughs> limited with Chrome OS once you're offline. Yeah. So, again, if you're going to get one, make it the 3G model. All right, so at $499, That's what are we problem. rating it? That's the problem. A two out of five. Yeah. Two out of five. Really We're saving expensive. you money, all right? Yeah. Chrome OS still has some kinks that need to be worked out. Because of its limitations, it's difficult to recommend the Chromebook over any other similarly priced Windows 7 netbook or even a tablet device like an the iPad. Potential at this point. To be it has I'm a huge fan of cloud computing. I like what Chrome OS is trying to do. This is a first step, but it's mm -hmm. a wobbly one at best. Yeah. I would wait. But I, I believe in the technology. I believe in the promise. I think in a couple of years, we'll all laugh at the notion that we had processors in all of our pockets and we had you know, hard drives on everything yeah. when you can just store it in the cloud. Right now, it's just too, too hit or miss. Yeah. All right, that's it for today's Gadget Prawn. But if you have a gadget you'd like to see us rate, email us at gadgetpron at g4tv.com. Okay. Still ahead, Blair Butler brings you an adult-only G.I. Oh. Joe comic book and the latest shocking chapter of The Walking Dead. And later, we're looking at the history of the Nintendo 64 and Tales from the console graveyard. But first, here's two ass men.
Welcome back to At The Booties, the only show that dares to go where most men have gone before, The Booty. It's an all vampire edition with booties that are super yet totally or mostly natural. Okay, first up is a sexy vampire strip tease, undead and undressed. Come on, vampire booty is sexy because it makes you question your own mortality and realize how closely sexuality and the fear of death are, are tied together. Now, I didn't dread yet desire my own eminent demise nearly enough by watching that. Also, her body has all the curves of a swizzle stick. Well, of course vampire booty is going to be thin. Bill, they're undead. No, yeah, well, right now my booty meter is dead. One slap. I am sorry, you're not comfortable enough to broaden your horizons, Bill. I think she totally embodies the potential of eternal life. Well, I've got to give this one five slaps. Pat, <clears throat> what you fail to grasp is the hypnotic power that the vampire booty should have over us mere mortal men. Like these luscious ladies, muse and angel. That's two booties for the price of one. I don't know if twice the booties even makes it better, Bill. I, in fact, I don't need vampire play acting and, and fake lesbian hijinks. I need booty. Vampires come out at night. Okay, obviously this video was clearly shot during the day. I can only in good conscience give it one slap. Personally, I admire the choice of a cinema verite approach to the vampire booty format. Four and a half slaps. Well, that's all the booty we could squeeze into the bodice of today's show. And next time, we'll be continuing our explorations into the supernatural with werewolf booty. No, that's a terrible idea. Hairy booty is not sexy booty. That says you, Bill. For now, the club is closed. We will see you next time on At the Booty. Fail. You're dead. Major fail. Fail. Good. Fail, 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 fail. You lose. <laughs> what is going on? I had a fuzzy fly. I had a fuzzy fly. That's why they outlawed Everclear. <laughs>
will definitely eat your brain. It's hard to believe, but even after 85 issues, The Walking Dead is still just as riveting, terrifying, and surprising as it was when it started. And in this 14th volume, hero Rick Grimes' attempt to build a suburban oasis in the middle of a zombie wasteland goes south and delivers what may be the second most shocking moment in the entire series. Look, I'm not gonna drop any spoilers, but if you're a longtime reader, this one will make you scream, oh at the top of your lungs. Zombies, Joes, and murderous Marvel mercenaries. All great and all decidedly adults only. So remember, very, very not safe for work. After Effects, away! <laughs> Oh, right you are, Candace. It was the magical box that Goldeneye lived inside. Yeah! yeah. By 1996, sales of consoles were at an all-time high. The 32-bit Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation were pushing the CD format. Atari was making one last effort with the Jaguar, and Nintendo would release their new console, the Nintendo 64. Codenamed Ultra 64, this was the world's first true 64-bit gaming console, and one of the first systems to offer 3D gaming. <laughs> The Sega Saturn has come out and has kind of been bungled in terms of its marketing. And uh, you know, obviously the PlayStation is already out. And here comes the Nintendo 64. And it's really offering something on these 3D graphics, these polygons, this sense of explorable world. The N64 sold for 200 bucks, was packed with a 32-bit graphics chip, four megs of RAM, and ran on a 64-bit processor, making it the most powerful console of its day. It was also boxed with a single controller, which drew a lot of attention due to its odd shape, buttons, and expansion slot for a memory card and rumble pack. That was an awkward, awkward joystick. But with that said, it gave us the analog stick, and that is now a mainstay of any console controller. The N64 would sell half a million units in its first four months and launch with two games, Pilot Wing 64 and a 3D version of everyone's favorite mustachioed plumber, Hello, Super Mario 64. Mario 64 for me is probably one of, if not my favorite console game of all time. It was revolutionary. You had a camera that never worked quite right, and it was incredibly frustrating. But at the time, it was a miracle of modern invention. Here we go! Game cartridges were ROM-based and could hold up to 512 megabits of memory. However, Nintendo would be the last major console to produce games in the cartridge format. The cartridge format was very, very expensive. The disc format was very, very cheap. This was one of those big moments when Nintendo started to lose that affinity of the third party. <laughs> this choice eventually led to many companies like Squaresoft, leaving Nintendo to produce games like Final Fantasy VII on the PlayStation. In spite of this, several games would become huge hits for the system, including the first-person shooter, Goldeneye. If you were in college or even high school, during that time and you didn't play GoldenEye, you unfortunately didn't have hands and life must be really tough for you now. For the longest time, you thought first person shooter, mouse and keyboard, but really GoldenEye made it palatable and made it entertaining. The classic brawler Super Smash Brothers. <laughs> and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, which is considered by most critics to be the best game of all time. Something as simple as the Z-Trigger lock and lock. <laughs> just once again changed how you're going to be building and designing games inside of a 3D space and how that was copied almost instantaneously from every other game that followed. Of course, it did have its share of missteps, namely Superman 64, in which the Man of Steel would fly through rings in a virtual world. Superman 64 deserves every bad thing ever said about it. It was unplayable. There's no time to waste. I actually think it's one of the, the, the most important games of this console generation cycle because it showed people how to make a game in the worst way possible. Your fate will be sealed, Superman. 
Over the next few years, Nintendo released several color schemes of the console and sold about 33 million units worldwide. But by 2002, the console was discontinued as Nintendo would finally give in to the CD format with the GameCube. While the Nintendo 64 would push several innovations, ranging from the analog stick to 3D gaming, Nintendo ultimately lost its foothold on the market to the PlayStation. The N64 should be remembered for being a very, very solid system that was rather maligned at the time, but it was just a wonderful moment where there was a little bit of experimentation and that Nintendo perfection coming out on that system. American Ninja Warrior 3 returns. Our American contestants are going to try and beat the course and win a $500,000. Only three out of the 2,600 athletes have ever conquered the course in Japan. And none have been from the U.S. No. For shame. It all happens July 31st. I'm sorry to end on a bummer. Uh, go to g4tv.com slash a and w. It could be American at the top of the mountain. You don't know. Stay tuned. Maybe. We're now returned to attack to discuss his new album. That's what he comes here for. I'm going to interview the hell out of him. He's one of my heroes. I love him. His hair smells like friend away. She's not the only musician with a questionable wardrobe. Take a look. It is an absolute honor to introduce Weird Al <laughs> There's an, an SAT analogy somewhere here, but basically you're our Bieber, so thank you. Oh, and I mean thank that, you. Thank I mean that in the sweetest way possible. It's an honor to be your Bieber. <laughs> thank you. Um, there's been a, a lot of controversy, and I know you've written at length on your blog about the whole Lady Gaga fiasco, Gaga Gate. Uh, if Gaga you will. Saga, thank Gaga you. Gaga Saga, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I've seen her video, and I've heard her song. I've seen your video, I've heard your song. Uh, let's settle this right now, once and for all. Okay. Who has the bigger penis? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with me, thank you. Okay. Rolling Stone. <laughs> All right, now, the, 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 the last, time, last question I'll ask about this, because you have talked about it to death, but in your heart of hearts, did she say no to your track, or was it really like a jerk manager? Was it Lady Gaga being Lady Gaga saying, how I, dare you? I, I, I choose to believe that it was, in fact, the jerk manager. I totally believe the manager when he tells me he's a liar. <laughs> but um, but, but this, this notion of doing videos for all the songs I love, is that, is that just because you have to in this day and age with YouTube? And Well, it makes sense now, because you know there was a period of time when like MTV didn't play videos. I think that was like the last 20 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and uh, pr prior to YouTube, there wasn't a whole lot of places where you could see videos. But now now, I mean, with uh, the proliferation of uh, uh, online portals like YouTube, uh, it, it makes sense because people can't see videos right. again. And uh, a lot of times people uh, don't want to actually listen to songs. They want to see the video. They want to watch so, the song. Uh, so this is the first time I've done a video for every single track on the new album. Do you have an app yet? Do you have your own social I network? I do. Do what? <laughs> no, I have, an, I have an app. I have, oh. uh, well, it's, it's for my, I wrote a children's book called When I Grow Up. Um, Actually, a New York Times bestseller. My, my, my writer friends, thank you. Congratulations. But yeah, I have a lot of very bitter writer friends because it's like, you wrote 851 words and you're a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> yep. That's great. But no, the, the app just came out. It's for uh, uh, iPad and iPhone and iPod Touch. And you can, uh, it's, it's a book, but it's, uh, it can have me read it to you. You can tilt it and the, the crayons roll off the table and uh, you, you can shave tarantulas and mas what? massage a gorilla. It's, it's and, cool. those are, and those aren't euphemisms. These no, are actual no, things actually, you can do in the book. Actual things. <laughs> Incredible. Now, you tweeted a photo of yourself. You were reading an issue of Mad Magazine, and on the back was a giant ad for Alpocalypse. Right. And you said that if you could show this to your 12-year-old self, it would, it would blow your 12-year-old self's mind. He would not believe they're selling ad space in Mad Magazine. <laughs> that, <laughs> would. that would... <laughs> this is where the fold-in's supposed yes, to be. Right, right. What the hell, Mad here? Magazine? Um, but no, I mean, would, would a twelve-year-old self would 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 have any idea that you would be where you are doing well, the things well, you well, are Well, the ironic now? thing was when I was about 12, year, twelve years old, I wanted to be a writer for Mad Magazine, and I had a guidance counselor in, in high school that said, "I don't think you have a future in comedy. You should, <laughs> you should be an architect or something." You're like, okay, I'll be an architect. I don't think I th your career path would not be on any guidance counselor's flow chart. No, anywhere. probably like, not. There's no, no aspect of it. <laughs> Nobody's no going to say, clip "You art. should be Weird Al Yankovic." <laughs> no, that didn't happen. <laughs> Um, and by the way, the reviews are coming in, and, and you had a, a, a funny thing about them, which is everybody saying, Apocalypse, it's really good. Not as good as the, the Owl album that I loved when I was 12 years old, though. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, do that's you... Do 
find that's a common thread? It, it is. It's kind of, of a universal thing. I mean, yeah, I, I think the, the new album, well, this, I'm a little biased, but I always think my new album is my best album, and I think that was this. But every, like, a lot of reviews are like, you know, the people that grew up with me are like, they, the, the ones that really stuck with them are the ones that they listen to at that age. It's right. like, you know, when you're 12, 13 years old, it's like that's when it really invaded their brain, apparently. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it, it would be telling if, if let's say, you were the, if this is the best album you've you released, then I would think the single would be one of the highest ranked singles you've ever released. But is that the case? Uh, it's, it's not on the singles chart. The, the, the video's doing very well. It got like six million hits in the first week. Uh, but the album, but the, oh, I, sh I should tell you, this is a, a exclusive news here. I just got a phone call a few minutes before the segment. Uh, I can't give you the number because apparently that's confidential till tomorrow morning. Uh, but uh, Alpocalypse is officially my highest charting album ever. That's what I was getting at. That was <laughs> So congratulations, thank you. Uh, I'd love to think that like uh, someone from Billboard will run in all stealthily and just shank you a couple times right. and then no! you hit it. Like, that's it. Why? Um, now, there's countless parodies. I've been on YouTube a handful of times, and I've seen that there's at least 12 or 13 parodies of like Rebecca Black's Friday out there and a couple other pop songs, but yet you are the only one that is making a living on it. Like you're Am still, I? yeah, yeah. You're, you're the guy. You're the parody guy still. What, what, what separates you? What allows you to do that? I, when everybody else wishes they were out yet. I don't know. I, I have to assume that there's some people making a living at it. I mean, just e even if you're a YouTube partner and you get a lot of hits, I think you can make a living enough to buy your macaroni and cheese. But I, I think I'm... I've been don't you have like a unicorn farm, though? Like, you've got... Well... <laughs> you're, you're crazy loaded off parodies. I'm probably doing the best at it because I've been doing it a long time and I'm sort of like the face of, uh, of uh, uh, music uh, parody uh, to, the, to the point where, like, I get the credit or blame for, like, every single right. parody out there. So that's a whole other thing. I think it's because you have swagger. I could be. If I may. It is my swagger. <laughs> that, 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 that is a curse, my friend, my swagger. Uh, all right. Um, the, the movie that I have uh, uh, forced every girlfriend to sit through, uh, <laughs> it's one of my favorites still to this day. It shaped a lot of my childhood. I would say it shaped my humor, but that would be doing it a huge disservice. UHF. Yeah! Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, seriously, I'll do it like... Twinkie Wiener sandwiches. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it was fine. It was. Totally I had fine. to do it. But yeah. you. <laughs> no, we did it. We did it out of pride and respect to the UHF. UHF two, uh, a YouTube-centric version. <laughs> would you would you be willing to do it or, or well, helm it or executive produce it? Uh, if if a major studio approached me with it, I would certainly consider it. But I don't think that's going to happen. What if I started a petition online and approached you? Would with you? It? That, would that would work. work. Petitions always work. All right, done. <laughs> you heard it there, Twitter. We're going to make UHF two happen. Um, I love Alpocalypse. It Thank is just you. as good as the albums that I love when I was twelve. <laughs> I and, appreciate uh, that. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's available now. Ben Gore is here with an all new weekend edition of DVD Newsday. He's reviewing the classic sci fi films Logan's Run, Silent Running, and Delay the Heaven. of DV Tuesday. Welcome back, film expert Chris Gore. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's jump right into it. What do we have up first? Uh, one of my all-time favorites, Logan's Run. Yeah. Renew. Now, how does this sci-fi classic hold up after almost 35 years? I'm gonna tell you something. That looks like a bottle train set, if you ask me. <laughs> um, so I will have to say, some of the effects. Oh my God! Are it's like hypercolor. Uh, <laughs> it's really cheesy, and then some of the, you know, the lasers and whatnot, like the the fashion seem out of place, and the hairstyles. <laughs> So, okay, that does not work, but the story is amazing. I mean, the, the romance between Logan 5 and Jessica 6 is one of my personal favorites, not to mention that when I saw this as a little kid, mm -hmm. there's a lot of nudity in this movie, folks. A lot of nudity. Is this there thing, still? This movie, yes, there's still nudity, <laughs> especially on this Blu-ray. It, it, what's cool is, is this film, in a way, kind of predicted how people hook up on the internet, because Logan goes into his little Sandman apartment and sort of dials in hot chicks so he can hook up with them. It's amazing. 
Amazing. Huh. Amazing. Love okay. that. I love the future. It's now. Okay, how are the special features? Uh, special features are great. I mean, you really get a lot of insight to the making of the movie, you know, on the commentary. What's funny is, is you learn that this futuristic movie set in this domed city far away was basically a modern mall in uh, Texas, uh, <laughs> which is pretty funny. So, so I, I guess that was considered what the future might be, is the mall. And okay. uh, so we're kind of past that, actually, at this point, I'd say. Malls are not really the future. <laughs> No, I don't think so. No. What's the bottom line? Buy it. One of women's favorites. First off, it's a buy. All right, what's our next DVD? Silent Running. Okay, now here's another film with a main character that's on the run. So, well, what's going on in Silent Running? Uh, Bruce Dern uh, plays a, a guy who's running a space station with the last known vegetation from the planet Earth. Okay. And he's he's sort of shepherding it through space when he's given the orders to blow it up. And he decides, you know what? what? I'm not going to blow it up. I'm not going to blow up all these trees and all this nice little nature. Why was he given the orders? I'm not going to do it. Because I'm going to guess that in the future we don't actually need nature. We can just grow it ourselves on and, and, and make it in a lab. Oh, okay. Good to know. Yeah. Any good special features? Uh, yeah, it's interesting stuff on, on the making of the film. What's funny about this is that the drones, <laughs> the, the robots, the robots Huey I'm and sorry, Dewey. These are hysterical. Well, the, the, the robots Huey and Dewey were played by little people, which inspired George oh, really? Lucas uh, with Star Wars to create R2 D2. So, and of course we have, uh, that's I mean, that's, cool. that's where that idea came from. So really fascinating stuff. And, and the fact that this was made so low budget. My only, the only thing I don't like about this movie, folk music. Again, oh, folk music. I, 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 I don't think what? folk music should ever be heard on purpose. Well, that's, it doesn't so, seem like the two go together. No, outer space film and folk music. Star Wars with folk music would be bad. <laughs> it would be awful. So, yeah, not a fan of that. But otherwise, great sci-fi. Okay, bottom line? I'm like, buy it. Yay! Two buys in a row? Two buys in a row. What? Doesn't happen too often. All right, what else do we have to check out? We also have The Lathe of Heaven. Now, why is this film in your list of great classic sci-fi? Uh, it's strange. This film, it, it's, it's a rare one, hard to find, but it was made uh, by PBS, actually funded this. Really? And it's, a, it's a novel by Ursula K. Le Guin about a guy, George Orr, who, when he dreams something, it becomes reality. So if he dreams that it's raining, it's suddenly raining all the time. And he, his doctor actually wants to use his dreams to make the world more perfect. So he says, dream world peace, and then aliens invade the moon. Yeah, well, how do you just make yourself dream something? It, well, it's, it's a suggested dream. So uh -huh. he suggests, I would like to dream racism away, because it's such a waste of time in human culture. So everybody wakes up, and they're all gray. So kind of all of the, <laughs> all of the, all the dreams to kind of make the world perfect kind of twisted. Change it's, things. Yeah, it's like, it's like a Twilight Zone. It's so much, such good sci-fi. I mean, the special effects and, and whatnot are, are kind of crude, but um, the story really holds up and it stars Bruce Davison who we know from the X-Men movies. Uh, it's just a classic. Cool. I loved it as a kid and I'm so glad and that it's out on DVD. It. Still love it. All right, so, bottom line? Bottom line is buy it. Three in a row? Three in a row, folks. Y'all, is this a record? Three in a row, folks. Yes, it happens rarely on the show. Oh first God. time it's happened to so us. so exciting. Yay. Three times. All right, we've got time for a quick pick. Yes. Another favorite from classic sci-fi, Flash Gordon Yay. with Woo. Sam Jones, Max von Sydow. Written by Lorenzo Seppel Jr. Guy used to write the uh, old Batman TV show from the 60s. So awesome. if you like that, you'll love it. Plus, also, when I saw this movie as a kid, there's a lot of sex stuff in this I never noticed. Oh, my God. This is what shaped who you are today. Exactly. <laughs> Flash Gordon perverted me. Thanks, Chris. Thank For you. more gore, follow him on Twitter at that Chris Gore. Now let's go back over to Kevin. <laughs> Comic-Con is right around the corner, and we've got just the thing to wear. Comic-Con is just around the corner, and to help you stand out from the rest of the fans, we're rounding up the latest geek threads. Now, the only thing we love more than our threads is our video games. Well, thanks to the guys over at Pop Chart Lab, we've got both. From the evolution of game controllers to a Pac-Man pie chart, they've got tees for all of you button-mashing fanatics. They've also got shirts with popular music hairstyles, fearsome predators, and a breakdown of every superhero power. But the coolest tee might just be this simple shot of Bill Murray, where he's filling in for the role of Han Solo. Ah, the force is strong with this one. You can pick up any of these shirts over at popchartlabs.com for 22 bucks. Now, if you thought the only thing missing from your closet was a badass wizard soaring through the sky in a flaming firebird, then we've got good news for you. Artist Mike Mitchell has created a whole line of epic tees, ranging from a machine gun toting centaur to a viking riding a unicorn with rainbows coming out of its ass. 
There's also this Dwight Schrute remixed with the social network, along with this pop-collared Brobocop. He's even made these shirts of a stylized Ninja Turtle, an ad-at with a cat twist, and an old-school Nintendo head, perfect for the fan 